Hi everyone, this is Alex and this is the first video of Computers of Chernobyl, a series where we'll study and explore the history of the data processing and use of the computer technologies in the Chernobyl zone. So our today's hero is Yes 1841, a Soviet professional workstation uh, that along with the earlier version Yes 1840 was widely used in a Jupiter plant in Pripyat. Because in a, uh, shortly after Chernobyl disaster, at that plant uh, was deployed a Spetsatom Special Enterprise, uh, which was uh, focused on robotics, on automatization, on dosimetry, and uh, various counter-emergency works. So, despite these machines were running just 5 MHz processor, which was technically a Soviet clone of uh, Intel 8086, uh, they were involved in various research tasks. And 30 years after, it's still possible to find uh, very destroyed remains of these computers scattered across the abandoned buildings. They are in a very, very bad condition. And uh, we got a spontaneous idea to just build the same machine and try to run it. Um, or in other words, to just turn that kind of junk to this. In this very video, we will talk about the overall design uh, and the technical solutions they use it. And uh, in next video, we'll look on the software and some specialized uh, boards uh, that uh, turn it, these machines to already really serious workstations, uh, to solving some tasks. But before, let me give you a little bit background and the history of it. So the main designer of these computers was Vadim Pichtin, who was one of the main developers of Minsk mainframes. And later he played one of the key roles in the development of the unified system of mainframes of socialistic countries, or YESAVM. So at some point there appeared an idea to expand this unification approach also to personal workstations uh, by taking the Intel x86 architecture uh, as a base and use some domestic chips and that's how this series actually appeared. There were around 10 generations of YES PCs, but from all of them the YES1841 was the most mass produced because in a uh, Minsk computer factory they manufactured around 80,000 of them. So in fact they were often used up to mid-90s and uh, despite that it's pretty hard to find them nowadays because uh, of enormous amount of golden palladium that was inside, uh, they are generally very very damaged. So, uh, we got like uh, three sets in a different condition, approximately like this one at Wukit, uh, from various places in Ukraine, like from retro computer enthusiasts, from uh, some scrap metal processing companies, and uh, eventually uh, we also got a call from Kharkiv from one guy who discovered that he has a folder of documentation, which was pretty important to have. And uh, with the help of our little POVI engineer, we eventually could make this clearly repainted, partly repaired, and looks like new. That times, Soviets didn't have some standard design approach, so an overall design of this computer is pretty different from what we are using nowadays. And uh, the first thing you for sure have noticed is that the computer consists of two separate physical units. This upper one houses the crate with the electronic boards and the lower one two 5-inch floppy drives and a hard drive. We also could find some original discs made in Electron Mash factory in Kiev in the 80s and they even came in this branded box specifically for these very machines. So each of these units had own separate power supply and the power switches surprisingly located on the back, uh, so which frankly is not super convenient. And then uh, some later modifications had drives unit with fanless power supply which made this machine slightly less loud because it has pretty powerful fans. On the side there are some perforations for the airflow and the fanless one version would have it from the both sides. And in either case when starting the computer the drives unit must be switched prior to system 1 otherwise it will not initialize properly. All of this is interconnected with quite thick cables and for instance these two are for floppy drives and one also for hard disk. The connectors were unified for these machines but they were not general purpose. It was not that easy to repair or make a custom cable if needed because of this. A standard display is a black and white 12 inch Electronica MS6105 which was practically a full clone of DEC VR201. 
And uh, it has 12 words power, so you get it uh, just by connecting the power connector straight to the computer. And also you could connect a cover monitor as well, but if you have been lucky and got this very adapter, you could connect a Western CGA display that would give you even 16 covers, because graphic card actually supported that. The computer also supported the mouse, or in the way it was called in the documentation, a manipulator of a graphic information color book. The mouse is 3 button one, it's very large, and often had a plain metal ball, like this one. It's close to the so-called bus mouse, so it had uh, quite a little electronics inside itself, and everything is done by a controller, shared by a mouse, and a floppy disk drives. But the unusual things do not end here, so I suggest to open the cover and look inside. So, inside is a crate with seven slots. We have five boards installed. There's a processor one, then a graphic card, floppy and mouse controller, and a two boards of RAM. Uh, one is 512 kilobytes and another is 128 kilobytes. So, totally, if you have three boards of memory, you can have up to one and a half megabytes of RAM. Like, not much, but that time, not so bad. We do not have a hard disk controller at the moment, uh, and uh, probably you'll find in the future. But if you need to install more than seven boards, you will need an expansion unit. But about that, we will talk in the next video because it's quite interestingly made. You can easily pull out the board. For instance, this is a graphic card, which you just release two switches. And here the Soviet graphic chip, by the way, has been changed to its Western prototype, it was more stable. And when we get all of this in this junk condition, uh, honestly, we didn't notice one funny detail. Do you see this keyboard connector, which is very different from the others? So, the surprise was that the processor board actually was from a military or KGB version of ES1841, which called Yes, 1845. It was a secured version of this computer for processing of the classified data, and you would not find any references about it in some public documentation. It looked like this, and in fact, it was with the very, very first Soviet machine in a tower, not a desktop format. This machine is so rare that in the last eight years of searching, I couldn't find even a part of it, and you know, it's a kind of holy grail for us. So here we are. We have an intact and compatible processor board. But the unusual things do not end here, so I suggest to open the cover and look inside. Removing the casing will reveal the backplane board. And here is a slight trouble, because despite the bus that connects all of this together is technically an ISA, uh, the form factor and connectors make it incompatible with any third-party boards. And to compare, in the later years you could install virtually anything, it matches a Western standard. And uh, 1841, however, feels very mainframe inspired because of this great design. From another side, there is a PC speaker and the power connectors from the power unit. And I have to say, it was quite well designed because uh, there are practically no wires here. And also, there is this serious industrial fan that will rotate a minute just by inertia if you touch it. And this is how the drives unit looks like inside. Here is everything is less densely packed because there is a crate with two floppy disks and one MFM hard drive. And uh, one floppy drive you use it for booting, a second one for the data exchange, and the hard disk was to store the data because the machine could not boot from it, only from the diskette. And depending on the version, inside could be drives of different manufacturers, such as Bulgarian Izot, for instance. Uh, but in this very machine, all of them are marketed as produced at Feb Robotron, uh, so from a major uh, manufacturer from the East Germany. But in fact, in this very case, it was just repacking because all the drives are actually from TIC and the hard drive is Coursera. All right, let's try to power it on. I think I need to check some high voltage capacitors. So, in the next video, we will talk about the software they use it for this computer and also about the specialized boards they use it in a Jupiter plant. And here is a tiny teaser because we actually had an amazing meeting with one of the developers of these boards and we got its engineering prototype. So, I hope you like it. Stay tuned and wait for new videos. See you next time.